This is Shani. Um, I, I, I apologize for our delay in starting this webinar. We had some slight technical difficulties in Paris. So thank you so much for bearing with us. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers and to all of you who are joining virtually for this transatlantic dialogue with economists Thomas Piketty and Joseph Stiglitz, who will be talking about turning points in today's turbulent world. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à ce duplex transatlantique entre deux dominants économistes, Joseph Stiglitz et Thomas Piketty. Si vous désirez écouter en français, appuyez sur le globe en bas de l'écran et sélectionnez le français ou vous pouvez suivre directement sur le site du Monde dans le lien qui est indiqué dans le chat. My name is Shani Peer and I'm the director of the Columbia University Maison Française and we are delighted to be presenting this event in partnership with Le Monde, which is the most important and most influential French language media group in the world and with Columbia Global Centers in Paris. Today's dialogue is a special preview of our inaugural Festival du Monde NYC with the Columbia Maison Française, which will take place next March 12th and 13th, 2021 at Columbia. Inspired by the Festival du Monde in Paris and Montreal, this special uh, first annual festival in New York City will feature French, Francophone and American thinkers, artists and public figures in two days of lively conversations, debates, performances, and other special events. We'll be sharing the agenda later this fall, so please stay tuned. Today's conversation will take place in English. If you'd like to listen in French, you can click on the globe on the bottom of your screen and choose French, or listen directly on the website of Le Monde in the link that's indicated in the chat box. We will have a Q&A for several selected questions submitted before and during the event. If you would like to submit a question for consideration, please use the Q&A button. Today's dialogue will be moderated by Sylvie Kaufmann, who is an editorial director and columnist for Le Monde and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. I'd like to thank our distinguished speakers and moderator, as well as our co-sponsors, and thank all of you for joining us. I now hand the baton over to Sylvie Kaufmann. Thank you very much, Shani. Bonjour à toutes et à tous, et je passe donc à l'anglais. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Sylvie Kaufman. I am a journalist at Le Monde, and I am going to steer you through this uh, extraordinary dialogue across the Atlantic. Uh, I have to say, if something good uh, has to come out of this pandemic, it is the fact that uh, by forcing us to hold this event uh, online, uh, it enables us to address much wider audiences uh, on both our continents uh, than if we were sitting all in a single room. So let's make the best of it. Yes, this has been an incredible year for all of us uh, and it's not over, as, as you say over there. Uh, as you know, some may argue we ain't seen nothing yet. The virus is still circulating dangerously uh, our economies have been put on hold with the devastating consequences earlier this year. Gigantic recovery plans are being set up and billions of public money is, are going to be spent to rescue our economies. We also have an election in the United States and major unrest in American cities with four more years of Trumpism in the balance, the stakes are high, not only for American voters, but also for the rest of the world. And of course, for us here in Europe, though unfortunately we cannot vote. This has not come uh, like a thunderbolt out of a clear blue sky. Dark clouds had been accumulating for a while with rising inequalities, questions about the cost of globalization, the challenges of uh, climate change and China chartering its own course. So we have a lot on our plate for this discussion and the best possible speakers to address these turning points since uh, they have both produced groundbreaking work on uh, in inequalities and globalization among other issues. It is my great privilege to welcome uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who is joining us from New York. Good afternoon, Joe. If you don't mind me calling you Joe, I am going to see you very soon on the screen. Here we are. <laughs> Hello. 
<laughs> Hello? Hello. Uh, I wish well, I could be there. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Stiglitz, as you all know, is, uh, is a professor at uh, Columbia University and received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001. Uh, you know, you've done so many things that I'm not going to uh, waste our precious time in, uh, with the long introduction. Just to mention that you have made very important research on, on issues like climate change, measurement of social progress, reform of the international financial system, uh, uh, among other subjects. Um, your books have helped shape the global debate, notably the visionary globalization and its discontents, which has been read worldwide, and more recently, People, Power and Profits, which was also published here in France uh, uh, recently. And here with me in Paris is Thomas Piketty, a professor at Uh, the Paris School of Economics and uh, École des Hautes Études de Sciences Sociales. Bonjour, Thomas. Bonjour. Uh, Thomas is the author of numerous articles in academic journals, but he's also mostly famous for his two books, Capital in the 21st Century, published seven years ago, and most recently, Capital and Ideology, published in the United States uh, this year by Harvard University Press. Um, both books have been uh, have not only been sold around the world, except for China for the last one, since Thomas <laughs> refused to agree to 24 cuts, I think, requested by the Chinese publisher. Uh, they have also fed an intense debate about inequalities and how to fight them. And may I add, Thomas is also a fellow columnist at Le Monde. So we have a short hour ahead of us, and this is how we're going to proceed. Uh, in the first half of this session, I'm going to uh, ask questions and moderate a dialogue between Joe Stiglitz and Thomas Piketty. And then we will turn to you, uh, viewers, readers, or listeners around the world, because I think it is truly around the world, and I will field your questions to both uh, our speakers. Joe Stiglitz, let me start with you. Um, I have very briefly described the landscape uh, that the, this pandemic has created. How do you assess the economic situation now in the United States, roughly six, world, six months after COVID-19 hit your country? What does it tell us about, uh, what does the situation tell us about the strengths and the weaknesses of the American model? Uh, the American situation is not good. And both the disease and the economic aftermath uh, reflects, uh, as you said, a lot about the pre-existing conditions in the United States. Um, the United States uh, was not prepared. Uh, it was not prepared in two senses. It was not prepared in having a good system of social protection in not having a good healthcare system. Uh, this uh, virus is not an equal opportunity virus. It goes after those that are most vulnerable with the weakest health. And uh, as you may know, uh, life expectancy in, on average in the United States is among the lowest in the advanced countries. But it has not, it today is lower than it was five years ago. So it's getting worse. And even more important, the average masks the fact of huge health inequalities. So that because the United States is the only advanced country that doesn't recognize the right of access to healthcare as a basic human right, there are large portions of our population that uh, have not, don't have access to healthcare. And because of the poverty, uh, don't have access to good nutrition. So uh, we had preconditions in that sense that made us particularly vulnerable. But there's another sense, we always recognize the importance of government in responding to disasters, mm -hmm. to government uh, uh, in natural disasters and all kinds of contingencies. In this particular case, we were again unprepared. We should have realized this. Uh, we had been warned by SARS, by MERS, by Ebola. And during the Obama administration, there was set up uh, a White House, House Office 
on pandemics. In fact, it was set under, up under the National Security Council because they recognized that it was a threat to our security. But we disbanded under Trump that office. We recognize the need that, that the private sector is not going to make the kinds of stockpiles that you need in order to respond to a crisis. And so we had stockpiles of protective gear, stockpiles of masks, but the Trump administration allowed those stockpiles to be depleted, even ventilators. And finally, to respond to a crisis like this, uh, you needed science. And every year, the Trump administration proposed 30% cuts uh, in the science budget. Mm -hmm. Most uh, relevantly, he actually cut the budget of the Centers for Disease Control, the agency that's re responsible for responding to contagious disease. So uh, it was the culmination of a 40-year attack on government uh, by the Republicans, and we're now getting the fruits of that. Yeah. They did weaken the government, and now we're uh, suffering the consequences. And how do you how do you judge the reaction, the response from the from the government to this crisis? I mean, on the on the economic uh, side. On, on the economic front, part of the problem was they uh, believed or acted as if they believed. We now got a record that they may not have really believed it that it was going to be just a short-term interruption. So the uh, economic plans were based on a V-shaped recovery. It was always a fantasy. Anybody who knew epidemiology knew that that's not how this disease with this kind of contagion was going to play out. So, so you mean the response was conceived for a V-shaped recovery? And, and it was supposed to be all over by the end of uh, uh, beginning of June, end of June at the latest. And of course, we're now in September and uh, it, it, the end is not in sight. But there were other parts. Uh, some of us were very concerned about the separation of workers from their employers, uh, mm -hmm. that we wanted to keep that bond. Uh, that, that connection, especially even more important in the United States than in Europe, because in the United States, most workers depend on their employer for health insurance. And you don't want to be without health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. And there were good models. Uh, Denmark early on uh, developed a program, France, uh, New Zealand, all developed ways of doing this. The United States Uh, Trump proposed uh, something, that, uh, a payroll tax cut for the corporations that would do nothing about the unemployed and do nothing really about this connection. And the compromise that uh, evolved had the banks at the center. And the banks were not concerned about helping the furloughed workers. They were concerned about helping their connected friends. And so the The result of that was the United States has had this enormous increase, the spike in unemployment. You probably followed it. It reached over 15%. And if you look at the true unemployment rate, it still remains a, a roughly at that level or even it, a, above that. It has decreased now. The, well, the official rate is. So the question is, what is the true unemployment rate? And uh, for instance, just to give you a, a, a flavor, uh, this week, the newly announced, today, the newly announced numbers of unemployed, um, uh, uh, new unemployed applications, you know, this is uh, months yeah. after the, is over 800,000. And under the new programs for what are called freelance workers, people who were not previously uh, eligible, Another 800,000. We're talking about 1.6 million new applicants mm -hmm. unemployment in okay. just one week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much um, for this um, um, somber description, I'm afraid. Uh, Thomas, it's listening to, to Joe Stiglitz, it seems that in Europe we are doing something right, but what is What is your opinion about the situation? And how do you assess the, yeah. the situation, in, in, not only in France, in Europe, because we also mm -hmm. have the European Union as an actor here? 
Right. So first, let me apologize that my English is going to sound a lot like French, but, you know, at least for the French speakers, you know, this will sound uh, familiar. <laughs> uh, let, let me also reinforce a point that, that Joe made about the U.S. situation, which is that given the, you know, the U.S. has a problem with inequality. It has a problem with its health system. And even before the pandemic, you know, the, the last time we had a country with a declining life expectancy uh, in peacetime uh, was the Soviet Union in the 1970s. You know, it's quite unusual, you know, to have a decline in life expectancy in peacetime in a, in a very rich country, much richer than the Soviet Union at the time. And so this reflects, you know, deep problem uh, uh, with, uh, with, with inequality with the health system. So from that viewpoint, the situation in, in France and in Europe is, is obviously better. Also, you know, we should, you know, what we have learned also in this crisis is that, you know, our public health system is not quite as good as what we thought before. And, and you know, we, we, we were, everybody was, uh, you know, very surprised in France to see that we didn't have the mask. And, you know, even six months after the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you have queues in the street of Paris of uh, 400 meters to get a test. Uh, you wait four hours to get a test. Uh, no, nobody really knows who should get tested or not because, because the capacity to test the population is, is, is very uncertain. So, you know, I think we all have to be modest about, you know, our, you know, the national social system and how much we need to learn from this experience. Now, there's been a response at the EU level, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, you, you referred to and the, the recovery plan that was adopted uh, over the summer by the European Union uh, is indeed a big novelty. And if someone has, has said, you know, six months ago or one year ago, okay, we're going to borrow uh, 400 billion together, 319 billion together to distribute it directly to, to, um, to national budget, uh, uh, you know, nobody would have believed it. So it's clear that the, the, the COVID is, is completely changing also the political landscape, the ideological landscape. Again, we should not uh, overestimate, uh, you know, the amount of what has been done. And, I, you know, 390 billion euros, you know, that's a lot of money, but, you know, the GDP of the European Union is more than 40,000 billion uh, euros. So this is less than 3% of European Union GDP. Uh, this is supposed to be spent over... Uh, uh, three to four years. So this is an extra 0.5% of GDP per year. Is this going to be enough? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also maybe the, the main limitation of what, what we've been doing in Europe is that we've still not changed the basic uh, political functioning of the European Union, which is that we rely on the unanimity rule mm -hmm. to make any decision of this sort, which clearly we see the limitation of the system. And in my view, it maybe it would have been preferable to have a recovery plan uh, adopted by a smaller number of countries than the 27 countries under unanimity, but with a smaller number of countries making the key decision to move to majority rule decision making on a budget, uh, 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 public debt, uh, taxation, recovery. Mm -hmm. Then I think we would have had uh, not only a bigger recovery plan, but we would have most importantly, uh, uh, you know, change the condition under which future decision will be made in Europe. And, and uh, so maybe this is what we will do in six months, one year, but, you know, we always postpone the real change in Europe. And maybe we will realize in six months or one year or in a couple of years that we didn't use this opportunity to change the, the rules of the game as much as, as we should have. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, I would like to ask you, uh, um, I have to go quickly to further subjects because time is really uh, uh, f uh, flying. Um, on globalization, what do, you how, what do you think will be the impact of, of this crisis on globalization? Because you, you, a long time ago, almost 22 decades ago, you, you mentioned the, the discontents. Of, but now we're really in the thick of it and we have, uh, including not only... Um, not only the America first policy, but on this side of the Atlantic also, uh, you know, this talk about relocalization, new supply chains, etc. What, what is your assessment of, uh, is this a fundamental change we are going to, to, um, to, to act on to, or, or is it just, you know, more just discontent and not, nobody is really uh, ready to act? Well, there are two sides uh, to the issue. Um, on the one hand, what we realize is that we're sharing one planet, just like climate change makes us realize we share one planet. 
Uh, those nasty viruses don't carry passports or visas and they go anywhere in the world. And as long as there are parts of the world where the disease is, is spreading, uh, we're all going to be at risk. So, uh, and, and we will all benefit uh, by the global efforts to develop a vaccine and therapeutics uh, and uh, to learn how to uh, deal with the disease. So in that sense, uh, there's been actually a support for globalization, for multilateralism, uh, the efforts at the WHO to develop uh, uh, a, a global framework for sharing the vaccine, and uh, the efforts in the scientific community to share their knowledge have been truly impressive. Uh, I have you know, friends who were working on this, and they said they've never seen anything like this. So that's the positive side, that there is really a, a, a strengthening of multilateralism and a realization uh, that we share one planet. That will be, uh, again, very important as we need to deal with climate change. Um, the other side is that we've realized that we've constructed a uh, economic system that's not very resilient. And one part of the lack of resilience is uh, global supply chains that are not resilient. Uh, we saw that so vividly in the United States where uh, here we are supposedly the richest country. Uh, we were not even able to produce masks, let alone, uh, you know, or protective gear, uh, let alone more complicated products like uh, tests uh, or ventilators. So there are huge deficiencies in our market economy that were exposed and those were related to some extent to uh, the lack of diversified, resilient uh, global supply chains. And that occurred in the midst of another drama that's been going on. I, we, we, probably we shouldn't go into it here, but that's the drama uh, between uh, the United States and China over a whole host of issues. Uh, uh, it, it, from human rights uh, having to do with Hong Kong and the Uyghurs to uh, security, surveillance, privacy, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, that clearly uh, is complicating uh, the, uh, uh, the globalization agenda for, and will continue to do so for coming years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Thomas, to pick up on this uh, positive sign that uh, Joe uh, Stiglitz identified, do you see in this crisis also an opportunity? A, a lot of people in, in Europe hope that uh, this is the opportunity to move forward uh, to a, a greener agenda, for instance, to a better, you know, to build a better future for, with a greener uh, agenda, with more uh, taking into account um, uh, better concerns uh, uh, about environment, social concerns also. Um, you know, with this public money which is being invested now, do you think we can fix uh, those major flaws that you have both been talking about? Well, in principle, we, we could, but you know, at this stage, I think there's a strong temptation, you know, just to to redo uh, what we did before in terms of uh, sectors. Uh, there's a big risk, I think, that we make also the same mistake with uh, with um, uh, the monetary policy that we did after 2008, mm -hmm. 2012, which is that we use the, the new monetary policy, the new money supply, basically to boost uh, stock market prices, real estate prices, which is going to benefit, uh, you know, those who own already a lot of assets, a lot of wealth, uh, but, but, you know, that's going to increase inequality and that's not going to solve our problem with the environment, our social problem, our problem with inequality. So I think we should really change the way we think about uh, monetary, uh, monetary policy. In terms of environmental policy, you know, what we have, for instance, in recent weeks is this uh, uh, quasi-military uh, fight uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean about who is going to get the oil and the gas uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And as you very with well Turkey. know, yeah. if, we want to, if we want to be serious with the Paris Agreement, in fact, this gas should stay where it is, uh, yeah. which nobody should get it. And, and, and in fact, the, the discussion that we have is, you know, is the French Navy going to help Greece to fight with the Turks so as to respect colonial borders that were drawn in 1920, you know, we are back to 
To, mm -hmm. It's not only the world of this yesterday; it's the world of uh, of a yeah. century ago. Yeah. And so, so, mm -hmm. and we've we've started to authorize again a new uh, insecticide and product for uh, for you know. Uh, Uh, sugar production in France, which we had uh, 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 you know, decided mm -hmm. to ban uh, a couple of years ago. And look, the, the argument that was made is, okay, these are really bad insects, we should not use them. But look, other European countries have started to use them for their sugar production. So if we don't do the same, uh, we are going to die. But look, there is another solution. And the other solution is if some other countries do bad things with insecticides or carbon emission, you know, there should be a carbon mm -hmm. tax at the frontier. And we cannot wait again for unanimity For, for this to happen because you know this race mm -hmm. to the bottom uh, on the environment and, and, and social matters and last and not, not least you know I want to say that to me the, the what's what's the worst part is that uh, you know what's happening in India or in West Africa or you know in, in the in the global south where we urgently need to develop a safety net system you know because if you have a lockdown in, in mm. India or in, in West Africa and you don't have a minimum income, you know, what, what are people going to do when they, you know, they, 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 you know, they're going to have to go out and get work and get food in one way or another. And, and so this would be an opportunity to build this kind of system. But again, this also depends on the global economic system, as Joe mm. was saying, which is with the kind of financial opacity we have in the global economic system today, it is very difficult uh, for, for, uh, for poor countries, you know, to develop an equitable way to tax uh, multinational, to tax high wealth individuals, and to build trust in, in government and in the possibility to deliver uh, public services and social services. So we are all bound together to try to To, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to improve this global mm -hmm. economic system. Yeah. So you, you, you both uh, agree that there may be, that could be an opportunity, but we are not there yet at, you know, at the point of uh, structural changes or, or change of, of paradigm. Uh, Joe, I, I have to, to, to turn now to the issue of the U.S. presidential election, because we are all, of course, uh, very uh, interested in, 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 its, in its outcome. Uh, uh, After this, uh, at the end of this very awkward campaign, uh, what what do you think of the economic program put forward by Joe Biden, the, the Democratic candidate, as uh, as as Obama's pre, uh, as Obama's vice president, Joe Biden appeared very much as a uh, as a centrist, but he has obviously uh, uh, taken some ideas from Bernie Sanders' um, uh, program. It, it, Is this a left-wing program? And do you find there some elements of the progressive capitalism that you have been advocating? I, I think the way to think about it is the entire country has moved in a more progressive direction. And I try to capture my book, uh, The Spirit of Where Progressivism uh, is in the United States uh, today. Um, so, uh, you know, the word left wing in the United States has taken on a, a certain uh, tinge where Trump wants to paint anybody with that label left wing as being in the same camp as Maduro or uh, Stalin or something like that. So, so uh, words have to be used fairly carefully uh, in that context. But I would use the word, you know, a, a, a longstanding progressive agenda which is concerned with making the economy actually uh, work better uh, by competition law, uh, by enhancing workers' uh, rights, by uh, preventing exploitation in all its forms, uh, including the exploitation of the environment and of our planet, um, but also recognizing that where we are today in the 21st century a basic middle-class life is not accessible to very large portions of America. And so the agenda that he's talked about is very much where I think most Americans are, which is they want uh, the minimum wage to be much higher. It should be closer to a livable wage. Uh, they want access to health care. They may want to make sure that everybody who's qualified to go to the university should be able to go to the university. You know, uh, the average level of indebtedness of America's graduate is like $30,000 and it's going up. It's, uh, we are closing off opportunities. The, the idea of American dream is, is now 
really a myth. Uh, so um, he has grabbed that. Uh, he's put all, you know, that, that is basically his agenda with a couple of other things that I've, I think, become particularly highlighted by the pandemic, which is we've seen among the people most affected are our care workers. And uh, they are the frontline workers, depend mm -hmm. on them. And then we recognize they're getting afflicted by the disease more, but they're getting paid less. Mm -hmm. So an agenda to do something about our care workers, which says something about us, ourselves, our identity, what kind of society we are, he's put that up very much uh, at the front of his agenda. And I think that makes a lot of sense, particularly in the light of where we are with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Thomas, what is at stake in this election for us Europe, in Europe? Well, what's at stake is, you know, the possibility to have uh, just a, a normal partnership uh, with the United <laughs> States on, on the climate and, and, uh, and, you know, capitalism, the economy, uh, you know, cooperation and taxation. You know, we were together this afternoon with Joe in a meeting for the whole afternoon in, in an international independent commission for the reform of corporate taxation. This is something that, you know, with Joe Biden could make progress, not as much as maybe as was that with Elizabeth Warren or with Bernie Sanders, but certainly a lot or more. as you would think, as you a, would a, hope. A, a lot more yeah. than, with, than with Donald Trump. And, you know, I, I think, look, in this primary election in the US, it, he, he, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren got huge support, especially in the youth. And when I say the youth, it's not just under 25. If you take... According to polls, you know, if you take voters below 50, uh, they, they got actually uh, much more than votes than, than Biden. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not saying we should only have the below 50 who vote, but this means that the, the U.S. public opinion, uh, mm -hmm. especially on the Democratic side, has, has been moving. And I think it's, you know, Joe Biden will be well inspired to to take some mm -hmm. elements from their program, which he did to some extent. Um, but, uh, you know, I think insufficiently. You know, I think the idea of a wealth tax is important because we live at a time where uh, uh, top wealth holders, not only in the US, but across the world, have grown a lot faster than the size of the economy. And so, and when you have something that's growing a lot faster than the size of the economy, you know, it's not that you want to expropriate everybody, bring it to zero, but it makes sense to ask to this group, uh, you know, more, more contribution to the, to the public good, especially in a time, uh, in a time like this. And the, the income tax is not quite mm -hmm. going to do the job. So we'll have this discussion again and again, but, you know, I think uh, it's, you know, all these discussions, of course, taking place mm -hmm. in the US are very important mm -hmm. also for all of us in Europe and in the rest of the world. And, and, and Joe, talking about wealth tax, where do you stand on this between uh, where Elizabeth Warren, uh, um, you know, campaign for, uh, I think, 2% wealth tax on above $50 million. And this is, of, I guess, peanuts for, for Thomas. No, but uh, Bernie, <laughs> Bernie Sanders proposed 8% on billionaires, and yeah. then Elizabeth Warren went to 6%. So they are competing, uh, you know, in, yeah. they are, they are, I think they're moving in the right direction. Okay, you know? and what do you think, Joe? Well, I, I think uh, a wealth tax is a good idea. Uh, and uh, the, the point is because we have so much inequality in wealth, uh, even a moderate rate, like 3% on the billionaires and 2% on those over, two, uh, uh, over 50, billion, 50 million, raises an enormous amount of revenue. One of the important points that we uh, discussed this morning in, our, in the meeting that Thomas referred to was that the wealth tax often can get income that can be avoided, can get uh, tax uh, things that cannot, can be av avoided or evaded through capital income tax. That sometimes uh, you can organize uh, ca uh, ways of avoiding taxes, taxes, income tax, so that the wealth tax can actually be a, a, a very effective tax. We had a representative from Columbia talk about how they had originally introduced the wealth tax many years ago uh, on that basis. On the other hand, I also think we need, we can't forget that uh, we have a regressive capital taxation in the United States and many other countries. Many countries don't tax capital gains uh, so that income of workers are taxed at a higher rate 
than people who are just clipping coupons or making income from capital. So uh, the wealth, you know, imposing a getting a wealth tax doesn't substitute for eliminating the deficiencies in our income tax systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is the last question from me, and then we'll move to uh, to our audience. And and Thomas, uh, I want I would like to talk about an issue which is very important between uh, the U.S. and Europe. It's the big tech and tech giants, uh, not only on the issue of tax, uh, but also on the general issue of the model. Um, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas recently said there were there are two models. The Silicon, what, and I'm quoting him, uh, the Silicon Valley model, which is about maximizing profits, and the Chinese model, which is about repression and author authoritarianism. Um, Europe, he said, has to find another way. What, what do you think of this description, and, and what could be the, you know, for the digital economy? Um, and regarding this, this problem we have with the tech giants, uh, US tech giants, what would be the European model? Well, I think the solution is democratic uh, socialism or participatory <laughs> socialism, as I describe it. So, you know, Joe is for progressive capitalism, but I, you know, I prefer uh, participatory <laughs> socialism, which I think is exactly what, you know, Europe Uh, has started to build over the past uh, century. So if you think of, uh, you know, German companies, for instance, uh, you know, you have half of the seats in the board of companies that are uh, uh, occupied by representative of uh, workers. Uh, this is not a perfect system, you know, in particular, because in the end, the, the shareholders always have the, the decisive vote and, you know, the system could be improved in many different ways. But I can tell you that this makes already a very big difference as compared to a system where you have 100% of the voting right for uh, shareholders or in system like in China, where, the, you know, the state and the Communist Party has, has the final say uh, on everything. So this is already an intermediate model, which, which is a, a quite... A, a significant transformation of the entire property structure because it means that if in addition workers or a, a regional government have a 10 or 20 percent share uh, in the capital of the company they can shift the majority mm -hmm including against a shareholder who has an 80 or 90 percent share. And I can tell you that when this was introduced, shareholders were very unhappy about that. And if we were trying to do that in France or in other European countries, in many cases, we will need to change the constitution a little bit, which the German did in 1949. And I think this kind of European model should be developed. And in fact, you know, there was a time in the 70s and 80s when Germany tried to pass a European directive on corporate governance, trying to generalize this model, but the French at the time didn't want, mm -hmm. and many countries didn't want. This is just an example. Now, coming to the tech giant, mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is basically the same general answer, which is that we can have democratic uh, regulation of uh, uh, capitalist forces. And in the case of tech giant, you know, it's clear that you cannot have, uh, you know, so much power, you know, concentrated into one or two or three uh, private companies. So either uh, it makes sense to break these monopolies into several entities, or if from a technological or organizational viewpoint, you don't want to break these entities like, you know, a, a railway company, SNCF in France, which you don't necessarily want to cut into two, then you need to have very strong public regulation of what they are allowed to do or not on European uh, territory. And I think this will have, this will have to come, you know, the ways you, you can pay uh, on Facebook to get more viewers and you, the way, you know, the entire process of uh, uh, diffusion of information you know, for, for political campaign in particular has been perverted by the fact that we let uh, pure uh, capitalist forces uh, basically do, do what they want. And, and this also involves taxation, uh, but, you know, it goes well beyond taxation. And I think Europe will have to, to propose, you know, a much uh, broader uh, uh, model to, to regulate capitalism. If you only focus on the big tech companies, mm -hmm. then there's a risk that, you know, the U.S. reaction especially with Trump, but also with Biden, will be, okay, you do that because we have the tech giants, but then we are going to tax uh, mm -hmm. your uh, luxury giants, your uh, wine, uh, everything. So I think it's important to articulate a model of, 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 of economic regulation and taxation that is universal 
in its scope, in, in the sense that it, uh, it addresses the, the, the issues for all sectors, you know, with broad principles. And I see a risk with the French uh, current ideas of, mm -hmm. of focusing on the tech sector, uh, including with, uh, with the Biden presidency. Do you, do you agree, Joe? Do, and, and do you think a Biden administration would, be, would make things maybe easier for us on this, on this um, uh, aspect, on this front? Can you hear us? No. Oh, yes. Um, uh, can I, before answering that, let, let me just want to uh, uh, very strongly support what Thomas said. Uh, you know, this uh, on Sunday is the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's article arguing that there should be, that companies should only maximize uh, stock market value, uh, shareholder value, shareholder capitalism. So it's an interesting time to ask that question. And just a year ago, the business roundtable in the United States said Milton Friedman was wrong, that companies, even American companies, said that they ought to be pursuing uh, a broader set of agenda. They should pay attention to the environment, to their customers, uh, to their workers, to the communities in which they operate. Um, back in the 70s, I wrote some scientific papers showing that shareholder value maximization did not lead to the well-being of society. But I published them in the Quarterly Journal of Economics and the Journal of Finance, but not in uh, the New York Times. And uh, Friedman's rhetoric uh, persuaded, uh, had more influence in legislators than my uh, more mathematical formulations. But over the long run, I have to say, after 49 years, my views turned out to win over Milton Friedman's if actually uh, America makes the kinds of corporate governance changes that both Thomas and I uh, think uh, that needs to be made. In the particular area of uh, tech, uh, again, I want to uh, highlight what uh, Thomas said, it's just about taxation or competition. Uh, it's all about a whole set of abuses, including concerns about political manipulation, hate speech, incitement, uh, misinformation, disinformation. So, uh, and Europe has been working to get a regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. Come mm -hmm. to your uh, question, there is a broad consensus among Democrats that we need to do exactly the same thing. We need to have a stronger competition policy. And it's not just breaking them up. It's also making sure that they don't engage in a whole host of anti-competitive practices that we've seen on the part of Facebook and Google and, and the other tech, show, Amazon. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that there will be actually uh, a much broader understanding of the need for regulatory framework that Europe and America can agree on. And it's a very different framework from that where China has. Because, uh, you know, we don't want the surveillance state. Uh, we want to uh, maintain a certain degree of uh, democracy and privacy. Okay, well, thank you very much. We've had, uh, um, now we know what progressive capitalism is about. And we also have on the European side, the participatory socialism. So um, that is quite, um, quite interesting. We have a lot of questions from our um, viewers and, 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 and listeners and, and, uh, uh, and readers. And some of them are, about, uh, many of them actually are about the debt issue. And um, uh, on, on both sides of, of the Atlantic, actually, we have uh, Bolivar Alvarez, who is asking, uh, how can countries get on the path of economic recovery with the high levels of debt? that they currently experience and that will continue to increase, of course, uh, with, with the si present situation. And we also have NACAC in, uh, on, uh, from Le Monde website, you know, who is following this on, on Le Monde website, who is asking questions in the same, um, also uh, uh, about uh, sovereign debt and, and how we are going to deal with all these debts. And, and there seems to be a consensus or a, a lot of economists Think, uh, seem to think that um, 
we can afford those uh, such a high level of debt. Uh, what is your, both of you? What are, what are your views on this, uh, Joe? Maybe we start with you. Yeah, I'm not right now worried about the debt. I'm more worried about not doing something because of fear of the debt. Uh, if we don't stimulate the economy in the right way and have a, 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 a re adequate recovery, uh, there will be long-term damage and recovering from this downturn, uh, this pandemic, economic aftermath of the pandemic will take years and years and years. So it is really important to do something. Now, the cost of servicing that debt with interest rates close to zero is close to zero. So uh, uh, there is not a problem right now in servicing uh, the debt. Uh, much of the debt is actually one part of the government owing money to the other part. Uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, holdings of debt has expanded greatly. So uh, you, if you netted it out, it's not uh, anywhere near as uh, what it was. I think it's important to use our money very well. And uh, one of the problems was that the $3 trillion that the United States spent uh, was not a very well-designed program. I mentioned before how high our unemployment uh, went. Um, one of the things, you know, picking up on the theme of inequality, is it showed a very deep uh, rift in our society. About half the population is living paycheck to paycheck. And the moment they get money, they spend it. And that stimulates the economy. The other half is very well off. They've not even lost their jobs. Their pay is doing well. And the average savings rate in the United States, which is normally close to zero, last quarter was 25%. And that means the upper half was saving well over 25%. So we have to be very thoughtful of how we use the money. And that's where uh, uh, Vice President Biden's agenda of build back, the uh, build back better becomes very important. What we want to do is, as we spend the money, make sure the money uses dual purpose. So we spend the money to help move our economy to what we might call the kind of post-pandemic economy we want, a green economy, a knowledge economy, a more equal society. These all ought to, that vision ought to be very much at the forefront of our spending. Tama, you agree? Yeah, let, let me, uh, you know, remind you that we've already seen even bigger public debt than this in history. So, you know, after, after World War II, we had up to 200%, 300% of public debt in, in many uh, countries. And, and the, the history, what the historical experience shows is that, you know, there are different ways to get rid of that. So if you take the case of, uh, uh, you know, Germany and, and Japan uh, after World War II, they used a lot of uh, exceptional uh, wealth tax in order to reduce very fast the public debt. Other countries use more inflation in, in France. You know, I think exceptional progressive wealth tax was, is, is better than, uh, than, than inflation, which Germany experienced in the 1920s and somehow did not want to do it again. And so it's partly why they invented uh, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, this, this exceptional wealth tax, which had the same impact. So the, different, the difference today is that we have invented this new uh, solution somehow, which is to, to that our central banks are taking a big part of the public mm -hmm. debt uh, on their balance sheet. So this is another way uh, indeed to get rid of the public debt. The only problem, as, as Joe was saying, is that the way we use this monetary tool today is that uh, in effect we are um, uh, we are boosting uh, stock market uh, prices, real estate prices. We are creating a huge gap between a zero interest rate uh, for people who have just a little saving on their bank account and people who can borrow at zero mm -hmm. or close to zero and invest it on mm -hmm. the stock market, invest it in housing. So, we, so it's possible that this monetary policy, in effect, is increasing inequality in rates of return across society, across the distribution, and in the end is, is contributing to raise inequality. And, and so you solve one problem on mm -hmm. the one hand, but you create, but you another, create problem. another one. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, in the longer run, okay, nobody knows whether interest rate will, will, will increase uh, in, the, in the future. You know, it could be that central banks uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in, the, in the medium run will be able to keep them very low. But with this price to pay in terms of very high inequality in rate of return, 
So the bottom line is uh, what we've done so far, the way we use our central bank to, to, to solve some of the problem is not going to be sufficient in the long run. We'll have to think more about the, the, the combination of uh, monetary policy, mm -hmm. progressive taxation that will solve in the long run this very large mm -hmm. level of debt. So there are solutions, but we'll have to you know, address the problem at some point in an imaginative uh, way. Uh, yeah, it seems that we are going to require a lot of <laughs> imagination in this situation. Um, um, there's a very different question about democracy uh, and also about populism for, from, um, uh, from Ivan Paravitz in Chile. Um, it's a very simple question, question. Do you believe that democracy is coming to an end? This is an easy one for you, Joe. And... Um, <laughs> And for Thomas, um, how do you see, that's from Fernando Eichenberg, uh, how do you see the populist and the far right threat today? Has, has this speech been somehow emptied uh, or is it still as, as a big uh, threat as it, as it, as it was uh, before this crisis happened? So, Joe, why don't you start? Well, there's a lot of concern and discussion in the United States about exactly that question. And let me try to explain why that is. Uh, over the last 40 years, uh, one of our two parties, the Republican Party, has uh, become a uh, peculiar coalition of evangelical uh, business leaders, uh, uh, a, a whole host of, of peculiar, you know, uh, 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 coalition and a peculiar coalition um, that basically advocates positions that are held by a minority of the population. A majority of the population, and as Thomas pointed out, a vast majority of young people are in favor of things like an increase in the minimum wage, health care for all, access to education for all, uh, including universities, preschool, um, you know, a whole uh, gun controls, you know, all, all these are, are a position held by the vast majority. Now, in that context, what happens to a minority party and a minority party that is, uh, whose base is a shrinking part of the population? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, their, their, uh, uh, their constituency is based on uh, the less well-educated, uh, uh, they've uh, very small representation of people of color, uh, very rural, and the country is becoming urban, very diverse, and better educated. So what do you do if you're in that kind of minority position? Well, what you do is you engage in, a, in an anti-democratic agenda of disenfranchisement, disempowerment, and uh, locking, putting democracy in chains. You do things like you make it more difficult to register and more difficult to vote. Uh, you engage in gerrymandering. You put a lot of power of money into politics. And the net effect of all that is really to undermine democracy. And the culmination of this is that uh, President Bush got elected as a minority president. Mm -hmm. President Trump got elected as a minority president. And uh, the concern is that this may happen again. And uh, it's not only true of the presidency, the vast majority of Americans voted for Democratic candidates for the Senate but we have a Republican-controlled Senate. So there's a growing sense of a large Democratic deficit in the United States. Uh, how this will play out would depend very much on this election. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, I think na nationalist uh, uh, parties and extreme right movement, you know, are still an, a huge threat uh, in, in, in the US in their own way, in Europe and, and across the world. And I think 
the only way to fight this threat in the long run is to reopen the discussion about different economic system and different economic policy. You know, I think the problem is that for too long, for many decades, uh, uh, we've told the public opinion that, you know, there's only one possible economic policy, that there's nothing government can do to change the economic system, to reduce inequality, that the only thing government can do is to control their frontiers and to control their identity. And then, you know, you should not be surprised that 20 years later, 30 years later, the entire uh, uh, political conversation is about border control and about identity because you know if you tell people there's only one centrist economic policy and and no uh, you know the policies and you know the, the fight the political fight is going to be about uh, about identity about and and that's that's very uh, worrying to me so i think it's it's really key and central to reopen the economic discussion if we want to avoid this extreme racial polarization of the political fight, which we see mm -hmm. with this election uh, in the US, but which is also rising in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, you know, the, the, the fight about, uh, the, you know, uh, extra European migrants, uh, about Islam, you know, has, has grown, uh, you know, in the past 10 years, 20 years. And, and you know, we, the, the, the risk that we get to a very uh, uh, racially polarized in its own way uh, politics uh, um, in Europe is, is very, very real. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back to ec uh, economics. Um, a French, <laughs> uh, a French uh, reader of, on, on Le Monde's website asked, you know, talks about the prospect of having massive unemployment and, and people uh, laid off when these, when uh, bankrupts are going to happen on a massive scale. Uh, and he asked whether we should consider again uh, a basic income. And so should that be considered and how would it be financed? Maybe well, Thomas or... Well, yeah. le le let me say that many European countries over already have a sort of basic income in the sense that there is a minimum income, mm -hmm. uh, which can be, you know, 500 euros mm -hmm. per month, 600 euros per month, uh, which we may want to raise which we may want to distribute more automatically, but which already exists as a basic minimum income. In the US, there does not exist such a basic minimum income and you have food stamps, you have, uh, you have various income transfer if you have uh, dependent children, but typically mm -hmm. single individuals yeah. uh, have, uh, you know, only, have, only have food stamps for various historical reasons, which have to do also with the racial prejudices, I think, and the un un specific antagonism of U.S. society. But in the European context, I think the real issue is to, is to, is to make the administration of the basic income more efficient, more automatic. You know, many homeless people don't have access to it. So we have to improve how it is administered, make it more automatic, in particular when you move from zero job to, uh, uh, to, uh, to low paid job, to part time job, to full time job, this must come automatically on your wage, uh, uh, on, on your wage that you receive each month, you know, you must have the extra uh, uh, income supplement, you don't need, you, don't, you should not ask for it and wait six months and when mm -hmm. your situation mm -hmm. changes, so this has to be a lot more automatic. Uh, and, and that's, that's, of course, uh, very, uh, very important. Can I just add one point to this? Um, go, it, go ahead. I, as I look at the world right now, there are an awful lot of jobs that need to be done. Uh, we have to we face a green transition. There's going to be, be, need to be a lot of investment that's going to be needed. Uh, there are a lot of people that needed uh, to be taken care of. Uh, we need to build a lot of infrastructure. So to me, the first objective of government should be to match people who want to work to jobs that need to be done. How do you do that? It's not been doing that very well. So I would like to put more emphasis on making sure that we provide jobs for everybody who is able and willing to work. Now, unfortunately, there's going to be cracks in the system. And uh, that's where the basic income comes in to make sure that nobody falls uh, into those cracks. But uh, I'd like to emphasize uh, the importance right now of uh, the so many tasks that our society needs. And uh, there's so many people who do want to work that we really need to make sure that we match the two together.
Yeah, but we do have the same problem in, in Europe, you know, with, you know, a, a, a high, I mean, at least in France, high unemployment, still, still high unemployment and a lot of jobs vacancies. So is it only about education, about training? What is, how, how, how do you match them? Well, you know, I, I think in some cases we should just create also more jobs, you know, in, in, in health, in uh, education, uh, you know, in the thermal renovation of building, you know, which is something we've been talking about forever. But in fact, even with the current recovery plan, we're probably going to deal with a very, very small fraction of the buildings and dwellings that should be uh, renovated. So, you know, you have lots of jobs here to be created. And, and I think, you know, the problem is that there is this sort of ideological view that because these are public sector uh, jobs, you know, in health, mm -hmm. education, or, you know, public works, uh, you know, we should not do it. But, you know, these sectors are going to be very important in the future. We have mm -hmm. to think of how we organize them in a decentralized manner so that they deliver uh, the right uh, public services where they should. But, you know, we are not going to organize uh, the health sector or the education sector or public work of the future through uh, shareholder company and pure capitalist company just to please uh, some ideology. Because this doesn't work. You know, many sectors typically the health sector, you know, in countries where it's purely capitalist, uh, uh, it actually costs more money and it's less efficient in terms of, of public health. So we have to be pragmatic. And, and right now in the recovery plan, I see, you know, some resistance, including in, in France, to invest more in, in, you know, just creating jobs in these, uh, these sectors. Okay, a last question, I'm afraid, um, but it's a big one. It's about China. Um, Actually, this, the, what uh, this Brian Spence uh, is asking, uh, who has been, who's been uh, watching this uh, discussion, uh, he says, should the growth of China's economy make Western democracies and their citizens think twice about their contribution to this growth uh, by their growing dependency on Chinese manufactured goods? Uh, and what political impact on mainland China, China could an organized grassroots boycott of Chinese exports have and would you support such a boycott? Um, Joe, we'll start with you. Uh, well, that's a, a, a big question. Let, let yes. Me, <laughs> no. let, let me put it uh, very more of minutes, broadly. Yeah. I think uh, that uh, at the uh, end of the Cold War, there was the hope that, uh, you know, Francis Fukuyama wrote this wonderful book called The End of History. And the hope was that we would all become liberal democracies and free market economies uh, very quickly. And Swedish, and Swedish social democrats, yeah. A exactly, and that trade would facilitate all that and, and we would be one happy global family. Well, uh, things have not worked out quite so well. Right. And uh, that uh, China did move in a way that looked like it was moving to a more open economy, but then it stopped and it's become uh, uh, less open than it was, uh, more authoritarian, problems in Hong Kong, the problems with the Uyghurs. So, so what went wrong? What went wrong? What, what went wrong? Well, that, that would be a long discussion of the internal uh, uh, politics of China that would take us beyond this uh, uh, discussion. Um, and uh, let me, you know, I can tell you that there's not unanimity in, in China. Uh, a lot of people are not happy about the direction in which uh, things have gone. Not a surprise. This is true in any society. But um, the, the point is uh, that, that we're making is that uh, the world today is different than when it was 30 years ago. And the hopes that we had 30 years ago have been dashed. And uh, at the same time, technology has changed. So technology, what we've been talking about, has given authoritarian governments uh, instruments to be even more totalitarian than ever before. We, 1984 was a, was a fiction, but the fiction of 1984 in 2020 may actually be a reality. Uh, 
and 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 that is uh, that is very uh, uh, that is very disturbing. So it is very clear that there, Europe and the United States are going to have to engage in a discussion. This discussion has been muddied by uh, Trump, who has been engaged in a narrow view on trade with the perspective it's all about zero-sum trade, uh, uh, their gain is at our expense, uh, it's, the mud, waters have been muddied by focusing on bilateral trade deficits and multilateral, a lot of small issues, you know, I don't want to say too small, but, but uh, he, he has muddied these waters that are really about human rights and what kind of society by things that are of second order. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it really is time for Europe and the United States to think about what kind of a global society that we want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thomas, you have the last word on yes. this. Well, yeah. You know, I, I think the, what went wrong is that we should never have had a free trade in exchange of nothing at all. You know, I think free trade and, and international economic relations in general have to come as part of a package, you know, where you have some common goals regarding the environment, regarding uh, uh, cooperation about, uh, about the fiscal system, about the financial flow, about the, the regulation of the banking system. You know, this, this has to come as a package. And this is going to be the same issue, you know, with Britain, uh, with, uh, with, with the Brexit. discussion over Brexit. You know, I think we have to say, the European Union has to say clearly and as soon as possible, okay, this is the kind of tariff that you will face. 10%, 20%, I don't know a set of good, but we have to be very concrete about this very soon. Because if we keep pretending that you can have, you know, 0% tariff uh, uh, in exchange of nothing at all, you know, whatever you do, and, and you can have a completely uncooperative strategy, which is also, the problem is this is very often what we have within the European Union, you know, the Deterlands behave like a tax haven, and they can still uh, pretend, you know, to be a frugal country in spite of the fact that they still 10 billion euros in tax revenue from the rest of Europe through, uh, you know, by attracting uh, 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 book profits mm -hmm. that do not correspond mm -hmm. to any real economic activity. You know, that's uncooperative attitude. So we have to change this, this idea that you can get free trade, free capital flows without anything in exchange. So I am for the circulation of goods and services and investment, but we need to take into account, well, first, the environmental cost. So if you have huge transportation of goods, at the very least, you should tax the carbon content of that. But more generally, uh, you have to participate to the construction of an equitable uh, uh, economic system, uh, an equitable uh, tax system, uh, uh, regulation of the financial sector. And so we'll have to move away from this illusion of, uh, you know, self-sustaining uh, free trade, free capital flows uh, without um, a, a global development model to defend. Okay, I think there are a lot of illusions we are moving away from uh, <laughs> these days. Well, the, unfortunately, this is the end of, uh, of our talk. This is another illusion I, I had that we could continue for another hour, but we'll do that again. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much to our two speakers for this fascinating discussion, which was organized jointly by Le Monde, La Maison Française of uh, Columbia University and Columbia Global Centers, which hosted us here in uh, Reed Hall in Paris. Joe Stiglitz, goodbye. It was fantastic having you. Bye-bye. Wonderful being here. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Piketty, merci beaucoup. Uh, merci. I would also like to thank our translators, Rebecca Reno and Antoine Vio. And thank you particularly to all of you for those uh, excellent questions. We could have uh, fielded many more. Uh, see you next year at the festival. And I hang the baton back to you, Shani, in New York. Well, my, my thanks to yours. First, to thank you, Sylvie Kaufman, of course, um, editorial director and journalist with Le Monde and a contributing opinion writer to New York Times. You were the perfect person for this role. Thank you so much to Thomas Piketty and Joseph Stiglitz on behalf of all our co-sponsors sponsor, here, here with us. If you've enjoyed this preview, we invite you to join us in person uh, next March 12th and 13th, 2021 at Columbia for the inaugural Festival du Monde NYC with the Colombian Maison Française. We are also offering some lists of readings that were put together by Columbia Libraries and Le Monde. And you can find a link to these related readings by pressing on the chat button. 
So that concludes our event. Thank you so much for joining us.